Visceral fat is the worst type of fat. It's the fat that sits around your internal organs. And beyond just contributing to a beer gut, it's particularly pro-inflammatory and strongly linked to poor metabolic health and poor cardiovascular health. If there's a type of body fat that you want to minimize, it's visceral fat. And while there's not really a way to spot reduce different deposits of subcutaneous fat, the fat under your skin, like you can't just zap your love handles or your muffin top, you can eviscerate visceral fat because visceral fat is different tissue than subcutaneous fat, just like muscle is different than adipose tissue or fat. Basically, it stands to reason that you can alter the metabolic conditions of your body such that visceral fat becomes more malleable, sensitive to fat loss, and cooperative at being burned off your body. In the randomized controlled trial I want to review with you in this video demonstrates just that. And it suggests particular interesting foods that could burn stubborn visceral fat off your body, including a common drink and one bizarre space vegetable. Yes, I did say space vegetable. I'll explain that in a moment. Now, this was an 18 month long randomized controlled trial in people with obesity that compared three different diets, one healthy eating guidelines diet and two different low carbohydrate Mediterranean diets. And both low carbohydrate Mediterranean diets included about 80 grams of carbs for the majority of the trial and were designed to also be isocaloric. Both were geared towards more unsaturated fat and included one ounce of walnuts per day. But one of the low carb Mediterranean diets was differentiated from the other by the addition of three to four cups of green tea per day plus supplementation with something called Wolfia globosa duckweed, also called mankai. This particular low carb diet with the green tea and the duckweed was called the green med diet. Now, on Wolfia globosa, this is a really interesting vegetable that I'd never heard of before. It's the smallest known flowering plant. It's relatively high in protein. It's actually a good source of B12, which is unusual for plants, and it's being studied for space agriculture as a protein source. That's why I'm calling it a space vegetable. Now the green tea and duckweed were added to provide an additional 800 milligrams per day of particular polyphenolic compounds, the relevance of which I'll explain after I reveal the results. Now, both low carb Mediterranean diets did outperform the healthy eating control diet. And the green med diet with the green tea in the Wolfia globosa generally trended to have an edge in all metrics. But what was most striking was the degree to which the green med diet lost visceral fat, with over three times the visceral fat loss of the healthy eating diet and over two times the visceral fat loss of the other low carb diet, with over 14% visceral fat loss. Now that's pretty impressive. Now to explain the results. Again, the main differentiator of this green med diet was the green tea and the Wolfia globosa duckweed, or mankai. What's more, even within the green med diet group, consumption of different amounts of the Wolfia globosa had impressive associations in a multivariate regression model with visceral fat reduction, as well as with improved triglyceride to HDL ratio, which is itself a marker of metabolic health that's linked to lower visceral fat levels. Now I want to get into the weeds a little bit more. The duckweed. You know, I couldn't resist the pun. And no, it's not that eating this space vegetable will make you an Asgardian alien with a six-pack like Thor. In the author's words, the way they explain it, the difference in preferential visceral fat loss may be explained by differential sensitivity to lipolytic stimulation hormones, which can be influenced by specific components of the green med diet, including compounds found in green tea or duckweed. Basically, they're saying compounds found in these foodstuffs may make visceral fat more sensitive to being lost. At a high level, the big idea is things in your diet your environment and your lifestyle can impact the receptors and sensitivity on different tissues and organs throughout the body. And figuring out how to fine tune these different sensitivities across organs is how we manipulate body composition and burn more visceral fat. 
It's a cool and really important message, and overall I found this study very interesting for that reason. That said, I will throw out some caveats before I get to my high-level takeaways. The interventions in the study were multimodal, meaning it's not possible to dissect exactly what's going on or how the low-carb diets, in particular the green med diet, caused so much visceral fat loss. Admittedly, as I stated, the green tea and wolfia globosa were what differentiated the green med diet specifically, which did have the standout performance. And if we assume that the diets were actually chronically isocaloric and matched for carbohydrate intake, at least with those two diets, which they do report to be, then we'd be led to believe that the green tea and the wolfia globosa duckweed did have a bona fide metabolic benefit, which is really awesome. And the authors did allude to more specific mechanistic arguments in their discussion of polyphenols that circulate in the blood. In particular, they found that high levels of the polyphenols hyperic acid and urolithin A were also associated with visceral fat loss. So perhaps these circulating compounds were the agents sensitizing visceral fat to being burned off the body. Indeed, hyperic acid is a known marker of metabolic health, and urolithin A is already known as an anti-obesity agent that can increase energy expenditure in part by increasing thermogenesis and the browning of adipose tissue, turning white fat into more beige or brown fat so you expend more energy, more heat at rest. But it gets more complicated too, because while these compounds can be found in some foods, they're largely microbiome-produced metabolites. So urolithin A is made by gut microbes from precursors called elagitannins which in fact is found in green tea, wolfia globosa, and walnuts. And the puric acid is a glycine derivative of benzoic acid and is also made by gut bacteria and is associated with more microbiome diversity. Thus, the generation of these compounds will depend, at least in part, on direct dietary inputs of their precursors, their building blocks, but also on the hosts, your, my, individual microbiome compositions, which interact with your overall dietary pattern and overall metabolic health. So it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem. Hopefully that makes sense. Or very simply put, and this is a broad truth, it's not just about the individual inputs into your body, but how they interact with you, you the host and your microbiome. All that said, based on these data, I do think it's reasonable to conclude that upping your green tea intake, possibly daily and multiple times a day, and possibly including some wolfia globosa duckweed, if you have interest in access, could be a decent idea if you struggle with excess visceral fat. It's certainly not required, but it could provide you an edge. As for me, and what I'm going to be doing, and my high-level overall suggestions, Given the known benefits of urolithin A and the fact that I like tea at baseline, I might be skewing towards more loosely green teas with higher elagitannin contents as a precursor to urolithin A. Green tea also contains hyperic acid, so you get both compounds, and it's compatible, green tea is, with most dietary restrictions. I also like walnuts, pecans, and macadamia nuts, which are also sources of elagitannins. So I may be eating more of those nuts as well and in particularly the raw nut form when it comes to walnuts and pecans because they have more fragile polyunsaturated fats. And for those who like and can consume berries, blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries contain elagitannins, the precursor to urolithin A, as well as hypuric acid. In fact, this may be one of the mechanisms by which wild blueberries have acquired their health halo. And dairy, especially fermented dairy, contains hyperic acid and or its precursor too, and may otherwise help improve overall gut health and support microbiome diversity, which is linked to higher hyperic acid levels. Anyway, with all that, I hope you found this interesting. I certainly found this randomized control trial interesting. And stay curious, and I'll see you around for the next one.